Our final presentation of the day deals with understanding retail, a media ecology perspective. Our speaker is James Tenser, president of VSN Media. James, take it away. Thank you. Um, well, first, I want to thank you, Don and Linda, both for the tireless efforts that you've done over the years to, to present the lead marketing conferences. I think there have been, if I remember, about 19 so far. This is and, the 19th. Um, uh, I've, this is the 19th. I, I've been a participant on probably about 15 of them, um, and um, uh, they've, they've been immensely valuable, and I hope the audience feels the same. So thanks for inviting me. Um, uh, so, so when I think about, I know this might be a puzzle a bit of a, of a title, so let's explain my thinking. Um, when I think about the future of retail, I can't help but remember this kind of tidbit from the and I know I'm dating myself terribly, but the fire sign theater comedy troupe, which is popular in the late 60s. And, you know, they said, we're all bozos on this bus. So, so I'm going to invite you now to let the air out of your shoes and buckle in. I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey. Now, when we look at this photo, we're actually looking at the Walmart IRL store. I snapped this in January in Levittown, New York. And um, uh, it's a server room. And uh, if you look at the reflection in the glass, you can see the ceiling is just covered with literally thousands of cameras and other sensors. And so many that you needed all these computers. Each of those blue columns has about eight or 10 servers in it. Uh, and it's just to process the data of what's happening in the store. So um, that, that's one glimpse of the future. And so welcome. Uh, the future is starting now. So, this is a little different kind of lead marketing presentation, I think. I'm going to share a conceptual framework that I like to rely on so I can make sense of the impact of technology in retail. And it does touch all the, all the lead bases, loyalty and engagement, analytics and digital experiences. And um, hopefully we'll talk about some of the technologies that are having significant impact on, um, uh, on, on, on retail and also on, on the way brands interact uh, within the retail environment. So why media ecology? Um, uh, why are we focus on understanding retail? Well, I'm, I'm trying to um, uh, offer a little bit of a, 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 uh, a tribute to uh, the sage, Marshall McLuhan, who famously wrote a book, Understanding Media, in 1964. And this aphorism, the medium is the message, is probably the most famous statement he ever uttered. Um, and I always thought it resembles a bit of a Zen riddle, right? So, um, uh, so how do we explain what that means? Well, I always like to use this analogy. In the hands of a caveman, a club is the medium. And the message is, this is my food, not yours. I'm a, I'm a devotee of him, and, uh, and partly because of someone I studied with in um, the, the early 1980s, uh, Dr. Neil Postman, um, who um, coined the term media ecology. And, and headed a department of media ecology at New York University, where I was a graduate student in, at that time. And um, he made the statement, media ecology is the study of media as environments. And maybe you can tell where we're going with that. So obviously spoken language is a medium of communications, but so are cuneiform or papyrus manuscript, Gutenberg's Bible, Morse's Telegraph, you get the picture, the Marconi's wireless, and broadcast TV, cable internet mobile phones, each, has a profound, each technology has a profound impact on human culture. And that's the message McLuhan was talking about. Um, and so to kind of carry the metaphor a little further, uh, Edmund Carpenter, who's a, a more recent writer on media ecology, says that the medium is a technology within which a culture grows. And we can forgive the pun there a little bit. But I, I think he's right. And, and um, uh, Dr. Nystrom, Christine Nystrom, she said a statement I think is really relevant for today's conversation. Media ecology is the, set, the study of the complex set of relationships or interrelationships among symbols, media, and culture. And we're going to apply that to the retail store. Right? So um, I like to say you know, a book is a medium, a library is a media environment. Right? A, um, there are a lot of different media in the retail store, but stores are media environments. So let's look a little bit about what we mean by that. 
So think about the immense quantity of messages that the shopper encounters in the retail environment. There are signs for wayfinding. There are signs for price promotion. There's price labels. There's shelf talkers. There's off-shelf displays. There's ambient music and other audio. You may have touch screens, kiosks, video screens overhead, enticing smells emanating from the bakery or maybe the pizza oven, and hundreds of thousands of package labels, the most common message in the store. And a label is a medium, but a store is a media environment. Right? A brand is a symbol that represents, obviously, the traits and values of the product, and it competes in the context of the, of the, of the shopping environment. So the store really is a computer uh, communications environment, excuse me, for brand messages. And I call that the, me the retail media ecology principle. So now to make things more interesting, it was easy to discuss this some years ago when what happened in the store stayed in the store. But, but today, the physical boundaries of stores are eroded considerably because shoppers carry their own media devices with them into the building. And that allows them to receive and send messages and symbols from anywhere else in the world. And all of this continuously influences their purchasing decisions. So I like to think there are no discrete moments of truth everymore, just a continuum of moments, or if you put it another way, every moment is a moment of truth. So I call that the incredible dissolving store. Now, in the incredible dissolving store, that's that environment for brand messages, there are three mega trends I think are exerting especially profound influence today. And, and brands are certainly aware of these already, but let's take a moment to define them here. It'll help our discussion. And um, uh, uh, for starters, let's look at consumers, right? Their priorities have shifted from buying stuff to having experiences. And maybe this is generational, but I know plenty of folks my age, boomers, who would rather take a trip than buy a new sofa, for example. And this is changing pretty fast even before COVID. But now either it's accelerating or maybe it's taking a, a left turn. I'm not, I'm, I'm not even certain. It's almost too soon to tell. But shopping is certainly different. And expectations are being driven by things outside the store. And if you own a brand, probably outside your brand. And we'll talk a little bit about more what that means. Um, we are seeing fewer trips and larger baskets as well and in grocery stores, and that's concurrent with newly added assortments in many categories. Retailers are adjusting. That has impact, obviously, on brands' ability to get the distribution they want. Um, so nested with that is digital life, right? It's now inseparable from life in the real world. Online shopping, you know, it shot up like a hockey stick curve, right? But at the same time, disappointing online shopping experiences may have increased even, even faster in, in the recent era. Um, and uh, that's something that has to be confronted. Um, we'll see if the, the online shopping preference is sustained over the long haul or if perhaps some folks fall back to older habits because they weren't satisfied. Um, and then on the loyalty front, the apps have largely replaced cards as a loyalty identifier because of the digital phone. And personalization of offers and curated assortments are expected. And we heard a little discussion earlier, didn't we, about um, in contact solutions, ideas about personalization in, in, in virtual shopping. I think it's true in almost every element now of the experience. So AI is seeping into nearly every facet of retail store operations, faster or slower, but that includes promotions, interactions at home with voice assistants, like you know, Alexa, Hey Google. Um, and now it's being adopted rapidly on the enterprise side. So uh, businesses are using AI assistants to help support decisions they have to make on a frequent basis. That could be everything from, 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 from reordering to um, uh, you know, new, product, uh, uh, new product introductions, et cetera. Um, that's not quite yet, but close to becoming routine. Let's talk about another principle that relates to all this. So, in, the, in the, the background of all this is this shopper that can be anywhere, anytime. Well, it's pretty clear that 
their loyalty is divided. All shoppers are split shoppers. This is another principle that I find I return to very often. Um, brand marketers and their trading partners, they're engaged in continuous warfare over a smaller and smaller slices of shoppers. <clears throat> well, there may be a counter trend these days, as I said earlier, about the lower grocery frequency and larger baskets. But nevertheless, this share of wallet battle is ongoing, or share of pantry, if you like. <clears throat> it's also about a share of time and attention. So consumer attention is finite, as well as their budgets. And these battles extend way beyond categories or departments or geographies. And brands are finding themselves competing against, for attention against social media channels, against entertainment, and various other experiences for a share of those dollars and the shopper attention. It isn't getting any simpler. Well, so who's your competition in the incredible dissolving store? Well, just about everybody. Your split shoppers are not agonizing over decisions between your brand and, and, between, and your arch competitor. They make their best choice in the moment, they just, moment and they just move ahead. And COVID made the stores dissolve, I think, a little faster than we would have predicted a short time ago. So consequently, loyalty programs, in, in my view, are more important than ever. They enable brands to maintain a sustained communication with individual consumers in the store and far away. And, they can get, and you can gather essential feedback and behavioral information from a variety of uh, directions. So um, I think a principle worth considering is that the bigger piece of the whole picture of the shopper that you can assemble informationally, the greater their value to you as a customer. And that you're not going to find that in one place. It's not just going to be their interaction in the context of a card, a loyalty card transaction. It's got to include information from elsewhere too. Um, this is not a simple trick to pull off, but it's becoming more and more essential. So the shift to digital, it also means that everything, everywhere is your competition for those slices of the consumer's wallet. And what I call the law of equivalent experience, the best service standards anywhere are expected everywhere. Well, that applies first and foremost to eliminating friction and speedy delivery, right? And um, before the stores all dissolved, by the way, we used to call this convenience. But it may also mean a high level of curation or personalization. And in some consumer categories, this can, be, can mean that an upstart digital first brand can compete on superior experience, even in commoditized product categories. And I know that's been worrisome to some brands. On the convenience side, if Amazon delivers a book overnight, your customers expect you to deliver your products just as fast and just as free. If they can do it, why can't you do it? The best service standard anywhere. If it takes a shopper four or more clicks or an extra form to complete to order something on your web store, well, a faster, lower friction alternative is just one click away. So leaders like Amazon, of course, and Walmart.com, they're using experience design to extend the perceived gap between themselves and slower moving competitors. Um, that's also true in, that low, in the low friction Amazon Go stores. At least they're trying to. I think the jury's still out about cons you know, shopper response to that. And, and by the way, the law of equivalent experience extends the functionality of your app too. <clears throat> so if Facebook lets users curate their feed, why isn't your mobile experience just as responsive? If folks are you know, scrolling through tremendous you know, uh, screens or pages full of items to try and get to the promotions or the items that they want to purchase on the, on the mobile, I mean, that is not the experience that they're coming to expect based on um, uh, what's happening elsewhere in their lives. That's an issue. All right. So remember, sticking with the digitalization and AI issue, remember when big data was all the rage? Right? Suddenly everybody had it, and the whole industry pivoted to figure out what do we do with it. But now nobody's particularly surprised that data flows keep getting bigger and faster and more diverse. 
So when you're drinking from, to use the cliche, a data fire hose, there can be a tendency in business to measure the easy stuff first. And it makes sense because you'll get to the more subtle stuff later. But there are some metrics, though, and I would have to include things like opportunities to see in advertising or page views on the website. It turns out they have very limited diagnostic validity. In other words, it, you can measure them, but then what do you do with them? Um, how do you extract the meaning? So the easy availability of these measurements can, in fact, become an obstacle to really properly analyzing the, the, the truths that matter because you, you basically use up all your bandwidth with, with these analyses. So uh, this is it's a human problem, but artificial intelligence is starting to be a big difference maker with this particular challenge, um, the, the, what I call the marketing metrics fallacy, um, because AIs are tireless, and they can work on extracting the really valuable meetings that lurk you know, deep inside those big data flows. Um, and it's turning out to be good not just for describing what just happened, but also for prescribing what could you do next, all that decision support. So that could apply to, for example, automated digital marketing. Right? You may have heard the phrase next best action, um, which I think is, uh, is, is one of the really strong ideas in, uh, in this area. Or you could call it, or it could be helpful for strategic decision making on things we work on every day, pricing, assortments, uh, promotions in the store, and, and personal, personalized promotions. So, um, so the takeaway from the, the marketing metrics fallacy is that sometimes the lowest hanging fruit, fruit here is the least nutritious. So this leads to something that um, I threw in here because I find it so mind-bending, I guess. Um, but it says so much about where AI can make a real, real difference and where it possibly will not. So um, Hans Moravec is an Austrian-born robotics and consumer science researcher at Carnegie Mellon University. And he famously has observed that math is easy for artificial intelligence, but gardening is not. In other words, intelligent agents are terrific at modeling large amounts of data from disparate sources and using the model to evaluate and recommend decision, uh, uh, decision options to managers. But they're not really good at frosting cakes, or I would argue not even at auditing store inventory, um, despite what the robot makers are hoping. And so this quote uh, from him I think is, is really wonderful. It's comparatively easy to make computers exhibit adult level performance on intelligent tests or playing checkers and difficult or impossible to give them the skills of a one-year-old when it comes to perception and mobility, All right? So mechanical robots and data robots, as powerful as they can be, I don't think you have to worry about them displacing most knowledge workers anytime soon. You know, human judgment is, it turns out, really a hard thing to simulate. Um, uh, with technology, that reasoning thing, um, uh, and, and certain activities too, which is um, uh, uh, as simple as you know, uh, you know, take, taking a, a snapshot audit of a, of a of a shelf in the store and, and bringing that information back. Um, turns out, uh, even that's not so simple. And the uh, the, the the robot solutions that we've seen, while well, fascinating. Um, uh, have taken kind of a brute force approach to this. Um, many of them are, have carry a couple dozen different cameras that are moved down the length of a gondola, and they're essentially reading the uh, price labels on the shelves to capture information. Um, uh, that's a different thing from tree machine vision, for example. Uh, it, it's a fast developing area and fascinating, um, and part of the larger in-store sensing. Remember, think about that picture from the Walmart IRL store we showed at the beginning. Um, that information is important. What we do with it, uh, what the AIs will do with it, um, uh, it's going to take some time um, to, to, really, uh, to really realize those benefits. But I, I do think that AI can make many of us better, maybe much better at our jobs by augmenting our decisions and, as I said earlier, prescribing possible best actions for the choices we need to make every day around all those 
uh, all those areas that are fundamental to retailing, product assortment, pricing, every aspect of category management, really. And I think every aspect of shopper marketing as well. And that certainly includes the way we promote and, um, and personalize those promotions. So let's look at another principle that I think speaks to why that's important. So retail has long suffered from what I call the paradox of scale. The bigger they get, the further they are from their customers. I think it's been a bane of chain retailing. In fact, if, you could, if I could focus on one criticism of the whole mass market concept, it's this. And it creates a loss of intimacy with shoppers. So mass distribution, standardization of physical stores, also led to uniform merchandising, managing by averages. And the larger and more efficient the retailers become, the less they came to understand about the individuals using their stores. So those averages are pretty well measurable, thinking about our principle, but less and less meaningful as the chain grew larger. And it certainly is a reason why loyalty programs become more and more essential and important in this context today. So now brands alone, you know, they, they, they played into this scale business and, and the ability to distribute in large scale is essential, but they also got sucked into this vortex, if you will, about distance from shoppers. And they became reliant on information available from the retailers and from syndicated sources as well to make decisions. But, but excuse me, those are those um, easily measured things that perhaps get in the way of understanding the individual activities that happen in the store. And so what statistic, I would, I would ask, is more actionable? a measure of a chain-wide response to a promotional offer, or an analysis of which ticket geography stores, shopper traits, are associated with high redemption of a particular offer. And we want that granularity now. And even more so, we want to personalize those offers. And, and, and that's a, a very important factor in restoring some semblance of intimacy between the brand and its customers. And I think that's still an ongoing area of development because what does it take to truly make that happen? Not easy, to say the least, but I think it is one of the core, um, uh, the core areas of initiative and, and innovation right now in, in brand marketing. Oh, okay. Um, a few years ago, I had a conversation along these lines with a very large CPG company that all of you would know if I were allowed to mention a name. And they longed for a world without retailers. That was the phrase, a world without retailers. Well, this is not because they did not highly value the distribution that they gained for their products. Um, what they were concerned about was how can they restore a more direct connection with shoppers and a more direct way of observing conditions in stores. Um, of, uh, and and at, at the time, that, that led to an investigation into machine vision, by the way. It was about 2009, and the technology wasn't there yet. I would say, by the way, that image resolution, speed of transmission, and the availability of artificial intelligence to analyze images actually is bringing that a, a really, really close. I mean, we're at a point now where um, a brand or, or a, um, a DSD uh, 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 you know, a DSD you know, field worker can point a phone at a, at a shelf set and get information back almost immediately uh, if they work with the right tool. So um, uh, the shift to digital is offering new channels to understand shoppers also, especially the online and social media interactions. Um, uh, so, and of course, the shelf image analytics I just mentioned. So brands, I think, are learning, and maybe some have to learn more, how to thrive in this new retail media ecology. All right? And um, uh, you know, machine vision is key. We see quick serve restaurants have pivoted really quickly because they've used information that's um, become available to them uh, recently to literally change their operating parameters as a result, you know, because of COVID behavioral changes. Um, the upstart brands are even if they're not actually being sold in your stores, they're still changing shopper expectations. 
um, which is resulting in uh, in responses from from established brands. Um, AI is changing the way brands can make decisions, and certainly how retailers can. And I think we're going to see a lot more um, uh, machine learning, um, uh, augmented decision making, decision support. You can use the phrase you like, but not just analytics that look backwards at what just happened, but analytic tools that help us determine the best decision. And then finally, I think consumer intimacy is about to enter a new chapter. And this is a very, in my view, a very, um, a very exciting prospect. Um, there's perhaps a chance to, um, to counter the paradox of scale, um, to measure the right things, the things that are really meaningful, and, um, and, and use that to, um, to really serve uh, shoppers better and uh, obviously advance brand objectives uh, more effectively. So I'll quote my favorite author, author in closing. Um, this is not a speculative fiction in my view, but uh, William Gibson, who um, perhaps is my favorite modern sci-fi author, he said, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. And all these things I'm talking about are happening certain corners of the retail consumer products market, um, I think they're going to continue to spread and um, perhaps change the way uh, we do business. So thank you very much. I hope this was enjoyable and fascinating for you. Okay, we have and, some questions um, that came in, uh, James. Let me uh, shoot them yes, to yes. you. Uh, the first one is, if shopper expectations are changing so fast, what must brands do to be more responsive to changes given that their business model is based on long production runs and economies of scale? Well, I wish I knew all the answers to this, um, and, um, uh, but, but this is a well-framed question. Um, uh, we're at this discontinuous moment now, uh, and I think COVID has a lot to do with it, uh, but not, it's not the only reason, but it's caused us all to kind of uh, break out of our um, uh, our uh, sort of continuous incremental progress mode that we've been in for many years. Um, uh, now suddenly they're changing suddenly. Well, for one, we can't really look at history or historical sales trends or consumer response trends in quite the same way because we've, there, there may be a loss of connection between what happened not that long ago and what's going to happen next. So it is really critical to get your sensing in line and your analytics, your your and, and, the, and the tools that help. And by that I mean artificial intelligence in hand. These things are not that exotic anymore. So information that can be captured in the store is essential, but also captured in the virtual interactions within the loyalty program. And we have to look at it, I think, in a in a um, in a very current sense and and uh, use AI to model what's happening currently so that we can begin to look ahead to what will happen next if we take certain actions. Uh, that may sound a little theoretical. I hope it doesn't. But um, uh, that will ultimately mean that further up the supply chain, brands may need to consider perhaps shorter and more frequent orders from the factory. I think that the consequences of that, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to diminish that. Um, you know, you could wind up, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, imagine changing the, the, the mass production concept to something that's more nimble. Um, that's, you know, that's something, uh, it's a suggestion not to be trifled with, but I think that would be a problem. For, for, for brands that are, that are manufactured overseas and imported, um, those long, uh, those long uh, supply lines, um, they've proven to be quite problematic this year, haven't they? I mean, I you know, feel badly for the apparel business, for example in that regard. So I think it's a change of thinking. It's a willingness to use better informational tools. I think they're going to include augmented intelligence in various ways uh, to make decisions that are faster and closer, if you will, to the, um, the moment of truth when the shopper um, uh, actually makes those purchases. Okay, here's a provocative question. Is AI really transformative? or is it just the next marketing gimmick from tech firms who want to sell us new solutions to old problems? Wow. Well, 
I, I, I'm, I'm a cynic too, and so that, that's, that's exactly the way, that's exactly the question that comes to mind for me, right? And remember my reference to big data uh, earlier? I remember walking through the trade show floors, and it wasn't that many years ago, and it seemed like every booth had, um, uh, you know, stapled an, an extra message about big data, you know, onto the header, right? Um, um, and this year we've seen a lot of booths that mention AI, and artificial intelligence has a, um, if you will, a, a, a rigorous definition, um, but uh, it's, it's not just a computer program. AI has a specific, a specific meaning, and in that, um, it's it's a it's a kind of software that can learn from repeated exposure to information, and build models for analyzing that information at a scale and speed that even the most expert human analysts can't approach. Um, but as we said earlier in more of X paradox, it can't do everything for you. It can't make the kind of judgments. It can't do certain kinds of, um, you, know, um, you know, physical tasks, et cetera. Um, so its best application is to augment or improve human decision making. And I'm seeing examples now that are for real. Um, uh, if you're looking to acquire these technologies, I think you're right to be skeptical and to, you know, really, you know, they say kick the tires and make sure that it's not just a label. Um, I do believe it's transformative. I think it's finding its way into so many of our experiences already we're just not aware of. Um, but, um, you know, um, you know, the best skill sets anywhere are soon required any, everywhere. And um, if, if, if Amazon's doing it, if, um, uh, if um, in fact, a number of smaller brands are are, are using this also. I think um, it is um, it is an irresistible force for 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 marketers. Okay, and our last question: uh, How is retailer brand marketer collaboration evolving now and likely to evolve in the next era? Well, continuing with the same thought process, I think it's going to become more information driven than ever. Um, that's kind of the key. Um, and I know it's, that's an old, an old cliche in our industry, right, talking about one version of the truth and, and so forth. Um, but in fact, we're interdependent, brands and retailers. And um, the, the more things change, the more important it is to have a clear picture of what's really happening. And that means measuring all the things that can be measured, um, making that information mutually accessible. You know, there are some folks that have platforms specifically designed for this. There are vendors that provide that. Um, uh, those um, uh, those third-party information sources, while still important, um, don't necessarily allow uh, the kind of um, you know, precision that's necessary. And, and I think information that is um, of high quality um, and, um, and that both parties agree on, well, that inspires trust as well. So, and if decisions are going to happen fast, if a brand is going to come to a retailer and say, hey, you know, we've, um, we've, we've run the models and um, our AI is telling us we probably should go in a certain direction um, uh, with, with, within our category, uh, the retailer needs to be able to trust that recommendation and that it's fact-based and not necessarily based on this month's sales objectives. Um, that's always been true. I think there's an opportunity now to be even more informational, more rigorous, um, more empirical than ever on these conversations. And I think that that's, that's likely to be true in the future. And um, it doesn't just depend on outthinking the problem. I think it really um, these days can be, um, can be improved by the right application of information technologies. And um, like I said, I think that's irresistible force. I think companies that, that, um, that back away from that are likely to be kind of left behind. Excellent. Okay, thank you, uh, James. That was a, a really interesting uh, deep dive into a, a, a future in uh, the in-store environment. I appreciate that. Uh, to contact uh, James Tenser and for, to follow up with him on this topic, uh, you can see his information, uh, contact information is on the screen. He's got a website up there and his email address. So you can follow up with him to uh, further the conversation. Thank you again, James. Very provocative. Uh, it was a great pleasure. I hope uh, 
I hope uh, uh, if it seems bizarre, I hope it's been enlightening some. And uh, I, I love talking about this stuff and, and helping brands apply it to their decision making. So I'd be very happy okay. to hear from any okay. of our well, audience. That, great. Well, that shows. Thank you very much again. All right. Thank you.